Hello and welcome to Energy 154 Unit 1. In this unit we're going to cover unit conversion review and fossil fuels. First I want to point out a general note of how these presentations are set up. There's going to be homework questions throughout the presentations and they'll be colored red just like you see on the screen here. What I would recommend is that you bring up the homework at the same time that you're viewing the videos and pause the video and answer the homework questions. So that way you're not trying to remember the answer if you have to do the homework much later than when you watch the video. So again, I would recommend bringing it up in a new window or new tab and how you can do that is right click on the homework and click open a new tab or new window or something to that effect. Um, but I also want to note that there are also other homework, as, homework questions on top of the ones that I'll be covering in the presentation, so you are responsible for those as well. So now that bit of housekeeping is out of the way, let me show you what the main crux of this course is going to be. So this is a bar graph from our textbook, um, Without Hot Air, and um, it's in Chapter 18. The left bar, which is colored red, is all the energy use for the United Kingdom. So you can see some big ones are a car, jet flights, heating and cooling, light, gadgets, food, farming, and fertilizer, stuff, transporting stuff, and defense. The right bar is the sustainable energy potential, production potential. So this isn't what the UK produces right now, it's what they could, what the, how the author projects what they could produce. And the big ones are there, the wind, the solar, the PV, the PV farm, biomass, shallow offshore wind, deep offshore wind, wave, tidal, geothermal, so we're and, and hydro is right there too. So we're going to cover these um, in depth in this class. And the goal for you for this class for project one is going to be to discover what these bars would look like for a specific United State. So um, I want each of you to pick a state and you're going to be completing this project for this. So you, we need to get really used to working with these units of kilowatt hours per person per day. And you can see it's a little bit deceiving, but it turns out all of these units are in kilowatt hours per person per day. The author gets a little bit lazy and doesn't put the per person in here. So again, like I said, you'll be completing a chart like this for a state of your choice for project one. So the first thing we're going to do to get today is get used to these units. So we're going to convert the following to kilowatt hours per person per day. So let's look at number one first. A person uses a 10 watt light bulb for two hours per day. Okay, so we look, we take the 10 watts per one person, we convert that into kilowatts, and we multiply by two hours per day. And we can see that our unit conversion technique, we cancel, we were able to cancel out the watts, and we end up with kilowatt hours in the top, and person times day on the bottom. So we get the kilowatt hours per person per day there. So let's do the next example. So we have an Energy Star label on a fridge that says it uses 570 kilowatt hours per year. It's used by a family of four. Okay. So we have we know we have used 570 kilowatt hours per year. So the first thing we want to do is get rid of the year and make days on the bottom. So we multiply by one year over 365 days. And we also know that this fridge is used by four people, so we divide by four people. And again, if we do our unit conversions, we, the years cancel out, and we get kilowatt hours per person per day. So the last one is that, let's say we have a wind turbine, and it produces 1.5 kilowatts and at 2,000 hours per year, and provides power for a family of six. So the same sort of idea, except in this case we have 1.5 kilowatts for six people, and then we multiply by 2,000 hours per year, and again we need to convert the year into days, so we do that with one year divided by 365 days, and that gives us 1.37 kilowatt hours per person per day. So let's look at another way we can look at um, the actual energy use of the United States. So this is one of my favorite charts of all time, and we'll see this chart throughout the semester. Um, but we just want to go over a little bit about what's going on at the main points of the chart right now. The very top is what we're really going to be dealing with today. And we'll talk a lot more about what's going on inside the chart later. But the really top means the estimated U.S. energy use in 2011, 97.3 quads. 
So what a quad is, is it's a quadrillion BTU. So this is actually 97.3 times 10 to the 15th BTUs. Remember that, we'll come back to that later and use that. So what we're gonna answer now is if we have that many quads that we use in the United States, we wanna do the same thing, convert to kilowatt hours per person per day for the average person in the United States. So this is three steps sort of, and you're gonna to have to do this for um, homework for different, different areas. So the first thing we're gonna do is look up the population of the United States, because we need the average person, so we need to divide by all the people in the United States. And you can go to wolframalpha.com for this, or you can use Wikipedia or whatever source you have. I like Wolfram Alpha because it's called a computational search engine. So number two is to find out the amount of energy consumption from the top of the energy flow chart. And we already looked that up and we can go back, 97.3 quads. And then we're gonna work our unit conversion magic and I'll show you and we'll show you how to do this. So I looked up all these things for the population of the United States. Again, it's gonna change slightly depending on where you look it up, but. I, when I looked it up, I got 309 million people. We've got the energy usage, which is 97.3 quads. And our unit conversion magic is going to be on the next slide. So in this case, we have 97.3 quads per year. And remember, the second thing I said there was that one quad equals 1 times 10 to the 15th BTUs. So that's the unit conversion for quads to BTUs. And then we have to remember the other unit conversion that we have 3,412 BTUs for one kilowatt hour. And then we also have to divide by 309 million people. So that ends up being 92.29 kilowatt hours per person per year. So we can see that that is the energy usage um, for uh, what's going on here. So that's the idea, is that you can figure out for any state how many, what's the average kilowatt hours per person per year that they use. So what I want you to do for homework is I have the California graph here and I also have the Delaware graph here. I want you to figure out what the kilowatt hours per person per day does the average person in California consume and the average person in Delaware consume. Okay, so that's gonna be one of your homework questions. And I would recommend doing it now so that way it's fresh in your mind. So now that we've sort of covered the unit conversion review, let's go back a few slides and let's go back and look at the some of the things that we use energy for. And let's go back to the United States one. So if we look at this, we can see that the very top of the graph and the very left side is all the energy uses. And most of the top left ones are renewable or non-fossil fuels. So this is solar, nuclear, hydro, and wind, and geothermal. So you can see the length of those lines, especially the renewables, are very small. Nuclear is bigger, but nuclear is a non-renewable fuel. And we'll talk more about that later. So with the big ones down here, the very big width lines down here are natural gas, coal, and petroleum. So those are the fossil fuels. So what we're going to cover in the next unit is we're going to cover really where fossil fuels come from because they supply a lot of our energy now. So it's important to know um, in an alternative energy class what we're using now and why. So let's look at fo the fossil fuels origin and the supply and what's going on with fossil fuels. So first if we look, um, this is the United States oil and natural gas production. Um, and this is from 1998, but it's still general trends, is that we have a um, very big um, natural gas production right in the middle of the country, and also in Appalachia, so to, to the west of Appalachia. So, um, and not so much in other areas. But why is this so? Well, let's first look at how petroleum and natural gas form. So a long time ago, you know, 300 or 400 million, million years ago, lots of tiny plants and animals died and they were buried on the ocean floor. So over time, they're covered by sand and silt and they're buried deeper and deeper. And as they get buried deeper and deeper, it gets hotter and the pressure gets more intense down there. So that, that pressure and heat turns it into oil and gas. And then 
what happened was is that the, this ocean disappeared and we were able to drill below the surface for the oil and natural gas deposits. It's a simplified explanation, but it's still good to keep that in your mind. So let's look at what the United States looked like, um, you know, millions of years ago. So if we look 94 million years ago, we can see that there's water, a lot of places in the United States, right in the middle. So right where all that oil and natural gas production is, is where, um, where, where we find um, that it was the United States was covered in water back then. We can also see some other areas of rich oil production in the Middle East were also covered by water. So that's one reason why there's rich oil and natural gas reserves in the very middle of the country. And what I want you to do for your homework is go ahead and expound upon that in your homework and, and, and answer me concisely why is there a strip of oil and natural gas production in the middle of the United States. So the other thing that we use a lot is coal. So coal is a little bit different. Coal is mostly formed in swamps. And um, the swamp um, debris, it's still organic matter, basically being buried over time. And when it gets buried over time and high pressure and heat, convert to coal. So let's switch gears a tiny bit here and let's look at production. So this is a graph of US oil production up until about 1960. And and so what we can see here is that it really started around 1900, started going up precipitously. And so at this time in 1960, there was this guy Hubbard. And this is a picture of him. And he proposed, let's look at this line. What he proposed was sort of radical at the time. And actually a bunch of his colleagues laughed at him. What he said was, we are not going to increase um, our oil production anymore. It's going to peak in the year 1970. This was a radical notion. Because look at this. If you were just to project out of this oil production, it would just keep rising up and up and up and up. But he said that basically, he used some mathematical models of oil, of getting oil out of the ground and said it's going to peak and start dipping down. So let's look at what happened. It's exactly what it did. And this was really surprising to a lot of people, and it earned Hubbard great recognition in the field. And actually, this curve, this, this line, is called Hubbard's curve. And it's the mathematical prediction of what's going to happen when we, when we take resources out of the ground. So what happens is your production goes up, it peaks off, and then it goes back down. So this is the U.S. oil production. So let's take a few more examples of, um, of Hubbard's curve. So this is the world oil production, but we take out the um, Soviet Union, Russia, and OPEC, because a lot of times their oil production is very politically motivated. So we want to take out those, those factors, those political factors. And you can see it's a very complex equation. You don't need to know what this is. But the idea is that this, this equation governs what happens to the um, production curve. And you can see that right around 2005, our production with the world minus the USSR, Russia, and OPEC-12 peaked. So that's the idea, is that we peaked. We've, we've, we may have already hit what we call peak oil. So the same type of thing, it's, it's not as um, obvious, but this is for coal and in the United States. Um, and there's several different types of coal, so that's so that's the idea, is that's why we're plotting several different types. It's not as, the curve doesn't fit as well, but it's still the basic idea. So what I want you to do for your answer homework is, what is Hubbard's curve in your own words? Okay, so I just want to put a little caveat in here, because over the past few years, um, we've seen something, something different happen. So like I showed before, this is the U.S. oil production up until about the year 2000. Uh, maybe a little bit later. And then if we look what's happened up until now, so this is the most recent data I could get, our crude oil production has actually gone up. So the, the big thing here is that perhaps we're not following Hubbard's curve anymore. So perhaps there's another 
thing going on here. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of years and see what happens to this production. But it could be the fact that we're we're going to a new peak, and that's very interesting. So mostly this is having to do with uh, fracking. So one quote I always like to end this unit with is um, something the former Saudi oil minister, Sheikh Ahmed Zaki, hope I, I'm not butchering that name yet, um, too much. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The Oil Age will not end because we've run out of oil. It will end because people invent alternatives. So the idea is that, yes, you know, we will um, probably keep using oil for a little bit, but we won't for alternatives won't be forced because we run out of oil. They'll probably be forced because they get cheaper than oil or they get better than oil. So I want to ask you this question for the Unit 1 discussion board. Do you think it is important to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy? Why or why not? And to receive credit for the discussion board, you'll see the rubric there. But I want you to post your answer in three more posts. So your three more posts can be replies to other people's original posts, or if someone replies to your post, you can respond back to them and um, do it that way. So you should have four posts total on the discussion board for full credit. So again, we'll end with a unit one check sheet.